This is the first fully working prototype of the Vector 3D Workbench, a workbench specifically for 3D printing that you'll be able to buy soonish. It's got enclosed filament storage up the top with some lighting, power distribution and space for tools. It's got space for printing and doing some upgrades or maintenance that you need to do, as well as built-in anti-vibration to reduce vibration noise from printers. If you have any comments regarding feedback, of course, leave them in the comments below or there's a feedback link in the description. For now, let's take a closer look. Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. So of course today we're taking a look at the Vector 3D 3D printing workbench. Today I want to focus on two main things. The overall size and why it is the size it is and what other options may be available as well as how it's built, the underlying frame, the way the joints go, and how we've kind of made specific decisions to help with cost and distribution and those sorts of things. Before we go any further, I wanna cover kind of what the project is and what we're trying to do. So I'm trying to produce a workbench, obviously for 3D printing, that is modular, meaning you can kind of make changes. So you don't necessarily have to have each part and also upgradable so that if you buy like the basic kit to begin with, it's nice and low cost, it's still a great workbench for 3D printing, but if you get to a Christmas or birthday or want to treat yourself, you can add additional upgrades to further improve that capability. In terms of overall quality, I'm trying to achieve something that will last pretty much as long as you will, <laughs> right? So a workbench that basically will last as long as you need it to, 10, 15, 20 years, Everything's built from robust materials and things that you can obviously replace. If you damage the worktop, it's not like glued or integrated into anything. You can just unbolt it and put a different one on. So the first thing I want to talk about is the overall size. Obviously you've got limitations here from the maximum length of extrusion and the size of sheet materials being around 1200 millimeters, 1200 millimeters by 2400 millimeters. The overall dimensions that we've got here, the height is just under two meters, the width is 1200 millimeters, the height of the work surface is about one meter, and the depth is around 700 millimeters. The height was chosen so it's not too tall that it won't fit in many rooms or be difficult to assemble or turn upright. The width was selected kind of to be in line with those sheet materials so you can have a really deep uh, workbench but not necessarily too wide. And the depth was selected because I wanted something a lot deeper than 600 because from my experience, that's just not really deep enough for 3D printing, but less than 800 because I've also tried, tested 800 on a similar frame and I found that just a bit difficult to reach the back and also trying to reach the top filament storage when you're already 800 millimeters back from that became quite a stretch. So a combination of those dimensions has helped reach something that I believe is a really good balance. The second thing I want to cover is the joints. The joints are so critical to getting not only a cost-effective frame, but also one that's strong and sturdy and rigid and durable. When studying how I was gonna do this, I looked at the most traditional methods, the ones I'd looked at and used before. So things like this, which is just like an L-plate with a bunch of holes in, which you can obviously bolt into the extrusion and then you hold one here, one here, and there you go, that's a 90 degree joint. The other one I looked at was of course, small brackets like this, well, they come in larger sizes, but you kind of bolt through into the extrusion in two directions, and there you go, there's a joint. The way I constructed the frame for the first proof of concept was to use brackets like this one. So, as I just showed you, and then some hammer nuts like this. They kind of can, you can kind of assemble the whole bracket with a nut on it, and then you push it in, it rotates, and that kind of locks it all into place. But there were a few problems with using brackets like this. Firstly, they're not that cheap. When they're very small, like for your 2020 extrusions, they're pretty cheap, but when you get up to one suitable for extrusion of this size, the price obviously increases as well. So for doing a whole joint, obviously you've got two screws in each and you need three of these for if you've got three extrusions joining together, that comes up to around nine pounds. So you're looking for about three pounds for one of these and then the two screws and nuts and everything that's associated with that which is not too bad, nine pounds for a triple joint, but then you, you start looking at how many joints there are on the frame and that very quickly adds up. Now the other problem with the assembly of these is not only are they a little bit fiddly, but they also don't pull the joint together very well. The way this assembles, it allows the extrusion to not be touching, which maybe in some cases is good, like if you've cut them by hand and you need the length to vary a little bit, that might be useful for you. But 
In this case, we want the joints to pull tightly together so that we have a really good strong assembly. So that was one of the problems with this bracket and with using hammer nuts. I did also try using the larger nuts, which you slide in from the end only and can't do from the middle. That assembly process took even longer, was much more complicated. The nuts are even more expensive. So that whole process didn't particularly go that well. The frame did seem marginally more rigid as a result of using a larger nut, which spreads the force over a slightly larger area, but by and large, not very significant. Probably wouldn't recommend these over the much easier hammer nut style. The other problem with small brackets like this is that they're assembling to the inside of a joint. And that's the space that we might want to insert a panel with some seal around in order to form an enclosure. So the fact that they sit there is gonna make the enclosure process and therefore the cost of it even higher. So again, not a great deal. Once I tested the basic L brackets, I moved on to trying L plates like this. These should be much more rigid because, well, they're much larger in terms of kind of the mechanical advantage they have over the joint. So I was expecting these to be really good. This particular one is a custom plate. So it's three mil thick aluminium with the holes spaced as I desired. And I got a bunch of these made so I could assemble an entire frame. Again, some advantages and disadvantages to L plates like this. Disadvantage, there's loads and loads of screws. So each plate, obviously five screws, each joint, three plates, that's 15 screws, 15 nuts, 15 washers per joint. Like for, by a joint, I mean three pieces of extrusion. So, I mean, that's really, really counting up, not only into cost, but the time it takes to assemble. It really took absolutely ages to assemble this frame just because of the amount of time it takes to insert all those screws. Put them in slightly, put them in slightly, put them in the frame, tighten them all up, go around again to make sure it's not squiff. It took forever. So assembly time went up greatly and cost also went up a little as well. One of the main downsides of the assembly with using these plates is again, they don't hold anything in a specific direction or kind of perpendicular to each other. So this allows you to assemble, although the screw holes are obviously nicely aligned, there's some wiggle room between the screw and the extrusion. So not only would they not necessarily be perpendicular after assembling them, you also wouldn't necessarily be touching either. Now, this might sound again, not like a very big deal, but when you've got a very large frame and you can get quite a bit of a mechanical advantage, those very small gaps do quickly add up to quite a bit of wobbly motion, which we obviously want to avoid. Now that's not to say that these plates are always useless and never use them. In some ways, if you're kind of, if you are happy to take the time to use squares and make sure it's really square when you're assembling it, using maybe clamps and jigs to force everything together as you tighten it down, you could still get a good frame by using these plates. But for something this size and the kind of assembly time that I was targeting, they really just were not the thing that I was looking for. So although these brackets have not turned out super great, one advantage that they do have is that they don't require any processing of the extrusion material. So you can literally buy full lengths, cut it yourself, and you're ready to do some assembly. If you are happy to do that, then that's a possibility, but the interruptions that this one has in the T-slot extrusion and the slight assembly problems that this one can have, hmm, not necessarily the best bet. So those are two solutions. Both of them kind of work. You can make a frame out of them. Sure, no problem but it's not necessarily that cost effective and the overall result was a little bit more wobbly than I wanted. So I went looking for other options, other solutions which people have made and created that could be suitable for my frame. And this is what I found. So this is called different things depending on where you find it, but it's basically a quick connector. So in order to fit a quick connector, first you have to have a 17 millimeter hole in the end of the extrusion well, at the side of the extrusion, then you insert this kind of piece and then another piece in the end. I don't know what to call them, but they're just two pieces. Once you've done that, you can tighten the hex key down and it basically pulls the hammer nut in the end, tightening one extrusion against the other. So the basic principle is you obviously have two pieces of extrusion with one connector assembled in one and just the T-slot in the other. You kind of put it in, turn it to the side and tighten it down and it pulls the joint in square. Well, obviously as square as the cut is on the end. I found the cuts to come very square from the supplier that I purchased from. So I found this assembly method not only really quick, but also really accurate. It meant I could 
get all the dimensions that were nice and square. I could use other pieces as jigs, so I could like set this like this, put another piece on there, and it just made the whole assembly process so, so quick. And it's also blooming strong and sturdy. Because of the way that it pulls the joint in together, you get a really good strong joint between the two that's not wobbling anywhere. Another advantage of these quick connectors is they, they don't interrupt the channel, the T-slot channel, which we will be using. So obviously they have this hex nut on one side, but in all cases, you can face that kind of out to the exterior of the workbench, leaving basically no interruption on the other side, which means you can put a profile and material in here in order to create a kind of box enclosure, sort of like what we have up the top on the filament enclosure. The downside obviously is that it does require some processing. This hole in the end is not necessarily that easy to drill nice and square and straight when you're at home. So some processing from a factory nearby that can do all that drilling for you is probably gonna be a big help. Or of course, me selling processed extrusions. In terms of cost, these are actually rather effective as well. The actual kind of quick connector piece is around two pounds 50 to three pounds ish but to assemble a joint with three pieces only requires two. So you've got the processing hole, which is about two pounds, 250-ish, plus the thing in the end. So you're looking at four to five pounds, so that's 10 pounds per joint. While that cost is not necessarily the lowest, it's still fairly low in comparison, and the assembly time is really quick, and the joint is really strong. So really, I think this is the best option that I've had out of all the three that I've tested. So that's gonna be it for me today. My voice is starting to go, but we have managed to cover everything about the joints and frame and stuff on the 3D printing workbench. So hopefully you're excited, I am too. Don't forget to hit subscribe to hear more about the workbench. This little mini series will be covering more details about the different design aspects and stuff as we go. And of course, leave your feedback down in the comments or in the feedback form in the description. I'll be super happy to hear from you. Obviously, as we're going through this design development, it's useful to have as much feedback as possible. So, as I said, that's it for me today. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.